Thank you. Praise God. Appreciate that music. What a great spirit is here tonight. I cannot wait to see what God is going to do. I've been so excited all day that I get to preach, and uh, God's telling me he's going to do good things. Thank God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 3. A nurse named Myra Guadalupe was strolling through North Bergen Park in New Jersey when she heard excited voices coming from the barbecue area. She said, I never walk by that area, ever. It's always crowded, and I don't like the smell of barbecues, but something told me to go there that day. The excited voices were yelling, he's choking, he's choking. She saw a man choking, already turning purple. Grabbed him, performed the Heimlich maneuver, was able to dislodge a chunk of meat that was choking him and wound up saving his life. She said, I jumped in to do what I could and the way he looked, I knew time was of the essence. Think about what she said. Something told me to go there that day. And listening to that voice saved a man's life. The scripture that we're going to read, Moses hears a voice in the fire. And that voice, if he listens to it, is going to save other people and is going to bring him into his destiny in God. I want to preach tonight about the voice in the fire. Read with me Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the back of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near this place, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing of milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt, the voice in the fire. I want you to look as we begin. Let's talk about God's heart. On this day that we just read about, what Moses was hearing and what Moses was seeing and what God was hearing and seeing were very different things. Moses saw and he heard Sheep. Sheep to him is money. It is security. Moses heard silence. Horeb means solitude. This is a place of peace and comfort. People are not hassling him in Horeb. Moses no doubt saw his life revolving around his own needs, his plans. He's building a family building a family business. He's building his life. He's been there already for 40 years. And perhaps it will be that life will continue. He's going to hear and see the same thing. But God, 
interrupted Moses. Because what God saw and what God heard was very different. Verse 7, the Lord said, I've seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters and I know their sorrows. This is God as we're gathered here tonight. God is looking down. He sees what people are going through. He sees their poverty. He sees people addicted in various ways. God says, I can see what other people are doing to them. The abuse that they're suffering. That is what God can see. He can see the physical and the sexual abuse. God says, I can hear their cry. Sometimes it is literal tears that God can see. God can hear the prayers of people who aren't even sure they, can, they believe in God. Is there any hope? Will it always be like this? God can see the desperate acts that sometimes are a cry in themselves. He sees people that they act in rage and violence because they're filled with guilt and hopelessness. He sees people that will cut and abuse their own bodies. God says, that is what I see, Moses. That is what I hear. In the 1920s, U.S. submarine sank in 150 feet of water. In those days, they had no way to dive to save these people. Hours went by. Those that were listening on sonar to, for any indication of life, they heard the tapping on the hull, realized this was in Morse code. Someone was tapping out the message, is there any hope? And there was not. They all died. You know, God can hear. It's interesting, our brother just sang about people in hell because God hears the cries of people in hell. Luke 16, Jesus tells us about a real man and it tells us about his cries of torment. Father Abraham, just one drop of water the cries of regret from this man. He's calling out, my family. I'm here, but my family. I don't want them to be there here with me. And 2,000 years later, that's a real man. He's still there. God can hear that while we enjoy our lives. God says, I'm hearing something very different. And Jesus tells that story because he says, I don't want people to go there. What God wants is he wants us to hear what he hears and to see what he sees. You know what this is powerful about this scripture? Is God is telling Moses, you are the answer to someone's desperation. Verse 10, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He didn't just say, Moses, you know about the answer. He said, you are the answer. They're crying in Egypt. They don't even know what they're actually crying for is God. How is God going to come into their life through Moses? And that may be while we're gathered here tonight that there are people in places scattered all around the globe they are crying out for you because you are the answer. That brings us to the issue of calling. God's plans for our life. Here's, here's Moses. He has a plan in life, but God says, I have chosen something for you, Moses. I have plans of what I want. I want you to be a deliverer. That is true of every person here. God makes plans for our lives. Jeremiah 1, 5, before you, uh, I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. 
Here is calling. Specific people that we are chosen by God to reach with the gospel. Moses is given, there's people in Egypt. One of the people who was living in Egypt was a young man named Joshua. Moses is going to make impact on Joshua, is going to rescue him, and then is going to train him to fulfill his destiny in God. We have each night heard reports, people who sat on those chairs and came and reported and what God was doing. Do you know what? Before they ever got to this point is there was someone chosen by God who went where they were. And God knew before they ever got there that someday they'd be sitting on this platform. Someday they would be reporting chosen by God. I have chosen specific people. I look out over this crowd and I wonder, who is it that God has chosen for you to reach? God already knows their names. Specific cities. It may be that God has chosen a specific city that you will make impact in. You might not even have heard of the city that God has chosen. There are people living there right now. And it may be that God will want you to go and you will make impact in an area. That is, that's calling specific nations. Every night we have had people from outside the United States. And it may be that God has chosen nations for us to impact. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, to preach the gospel in regions beyond. Beyond the borders of where I'm living now. In December, I went to the conference in Bangalore, India. God is doing a powerful work there. I was looking at the work of God that God is doing in India. You know, Sometimes God will choose you to open a nation. Think about the privilege, the very first people from our fellowship that went to India, Oscar, Linda Gafour, went to Bangalore, India. And not long before they left India, a young couple got saved, Paki and Samantha Raj. You're going to hear him preach the gospel with power tomorrow. Think about that. God chose the privilege of opening a nation. This couple saved, discipled by the Rubianuses, and now making impact. That is God. He chooses things for our lives. And God says, I want you to hear what I hear. I want you to see what I see. Lift up your eyes. Let's talk about a second thing from this scripture. Let's talk about God's fire. Knowing about the need is not enough. If Moses simply knew that there was a need, hey, there's people suffering there, that's not enough because if he tries to meet the need by himself, it is not going to work. He tried that, didn't he? He knew God's people were being oppressed, and so what does he do? He beats the Egyptian. That is like a lot of pastors. <laughs> they can see there's a problem, and they think the answer is another beating. <laughs> and it doesn't work. Like so many of us, we try to meet the need, but something is missing. Like the disciples, we have to say, we fished all night. We've caught nothing. Some of you can say, we fished for the last six months. We're not catching anything. The disciples who asked, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Something is missing. I want you to notice from this passage, before Moses can fulfill the mission, he first had to encounter the fire. 
Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. Fire is the very nature of God. Our God is a consuming fire. That is his nature. That is his character. Fire in the Bible is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is God at work. Here are people with their problems. God in heaven, but the fire came down to where Moses was. And that is what the Holy Spirit is, is God at work. Because that is what we desperately need, God doing something. He's not simply we know that he's there because he's omnipresent. I'm talking about God coming down where we live, doing something, setting people free. But please notice the order here. Fire comes first. You must encounter the fire before you can fulfill the mission. The problem is too many people, they mean well, they are good-hearted, but they're trying to fulfill God's mission without encountering God's fire. Let me ask you a question tonight. Aren't you tired of what you can do? Aren't you try to, tired of trying to talk people out of hell Please don't go to hell. It's really hot. Isn't that frustrating? I'm doing a Sunday school at the moment on the Holy Spirit called Power for Today. And what I've been challenging people, my, my concern, we are Pentecostals. We believe in speaking in tongues. But my concern is that there are people, they have stopped at the tongues and they miss the whole point, which is power. I've given a challenge. Read the book of Acts and ask a simple question. Every time you see what the Holy Spirit is doing, ask yourself, do I have that power? The fire of God is God doing something. Look at what Holy Spirit fire will do. Number one, the fire transforms. The disciples, they were radically different before the fire and after the fire. Something changed in them. What part of you is different after you were filled with the Holy Ghost? What is transformational? Because the fire transforms. The fire energizes. The mark of fire is passion. The disciples understood the scripture applied to Jesus. Zeal for your house has consumed me. That word is to boil. He was on fire. It was the disciples when they spoke to Jesus. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? It was more than information. It was more than us saying, so true, so true. They said something was a flame in our hearts. I'm talking about a supernatural hunger for God, His will. We talk about people being on fire. Our word in English, enthusiasm, it literally is full of God. That's what the word means. Passion. And the fire enables. Think about God's task that he's calling Moses to. Moses, you and your brother are going to go into the most powerful nation on earth at that time. You and your brother are going to overcome all of their military and political and religious and demonic power. You too. No problem. That is an impossible task. Not only does Moses not have what it takes, but God knows he's going to face stubborn people, huge problems. He's going to fight supernatural enemies. But God says, if you encounter the fire first, none of those things matter. The fire will be enough. 
to overcome all of that. God is going to give him an ability to speak, whether that is boldness or whether that is supernatural effectiveness. Acts 2.37, when Peter stands up to preach, the Bible says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You can read the words. I don't know if, if the sermon is impressive or not. What was impressive is Holy Ghost fire did more than Peter could do. There was a response, supernatural conviction that is what we want, whether we're talking about witnessing, testifying, or preaching. We want God doing more than we can do, saying more than we can say. My Sunday school, a couple of weeks ago, I was pointing out on the day of Pentecost, the miracle was not that they spoke different languages, it's that the people each heard in their own language. And I made the comment, is the Holy Spirit can cause people to hear whatever he wants them to hear, whatever they need to hear. Young man in our church came up to me afterward, Chris Wagner. He said before he was saved, he wanted to date a girl in our church and she told him, no, you're not a Christian. So he said to himself, I can play the game. I'm just gonna come to church and play the game, act like a Christian so I can date the girl. Never been to church before, came into the service the first time, and I was preaching, and he said, you started preaching, and you said, some of you are just playing the game. <laughs> he said, you need to stop playing games with God, and he said, you just kept saying it over and over in the service. <laughs> While he's telling me, I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like me. He said, finally, I said, all right, you got me. The altar call lifted his hand, came down and got saved. Afterwards, he's telling the mother of the girl he wanted to date, he said, man, that guy was saying exactly what I was thinking. He kept saying, you need to stop playing the game. And she said, no, he wasn't. He was preaching on tithing. but the Holy Spirit was saying more than I was saying. The Holy Spirit was saying exactly what he needed to hear. That is Holy Ghost fire. And in our scripture, the Bible says, Moses had to turn aside to encounter the fire. Verse three, I will turn aside to see this great sight. You know what Moses did? Everything changed when Moses got near the fire. That is the real truth. You, you, there are many things you're hoping to learn. You're looking for tips and advertising and what riba. Listen, everything changes if you will get near the fire. Moses' attention had to change. His schedule had to change. His priorities had to change. Fire, that's what I need. Jesus' command to the disciples was wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He was telling them, you need to spend time doing nothing but seeking the fire. That is what you need. You need to focus. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you turned aside and the cry of your heart, the focus was simply, God, I need to encounter the fire of the Holy Ghost. What would you do? It's a gift from the Father. He wants to give it. Are you willing to turn aside? Are you willing to seek it in prayer? I don't know whether you need to fast. Fire begins with hunger. Aren't you tired of what you can do? Because the fire makes the mission possible. Let's talk final, finally about God's voice. In our scripture, the indispensable part of God's will and God's work is God's voice. Verse 4 and 5, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, 
God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Everything changes when God speaks. God's voice demands attention. Verse 4, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Moses is busy with other things, but God has something to say. God began to speak to Moses when he turned aside. God's voice, sometimes it interrupts. It's not convenient. God may tell you something that wasn't on your agenda. God spoke to me. 1995, God told me, I want you to go to South Africa. I was not thinking about it. Wasn't planning on that. God spoke. He has that right. You know, what really has to happen is we have to open ourselves to God's voice. Eli told Samuel, say this, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. In prayer, prayer is not simply giving God your shopping list. Part of prayer is also asking, what do you want to say? I pray that you have come to conference with this spirit, God. This week, I need you to speak. What do you want to say? Because if God speaks, that makes all of the difference. God's voice contains an instruction. Take your sandals off your feet. That is an instruction. When God speaks, it may be for some of you this week, God will speak and say, I want you to preach the gospel. God may say to you, I want you to go. He may say to pastors, I want you to plant or to send. He may tell you, I want you to give. None of the men who've taken offerings this week have told you how much to give. Because that's God's job. But God's voice, it has an instruction. And what God requires when he speaks is a response of action. Because this is the issue, what will you do when God speaks? We need to respond in obedience. Take off your shoes. John 2, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Listen, take off your shoes. It's hot. There's rocks and sticks. There's snakes. Why would I do that? When God speaks, it's not important that you understand fully. It's not, it doesn't matter whether it was on your agenda. The issue is, will you obey? Reinhard Bonnke, he said the Holy Spirit spoke to him one day and said, I'm going to give you a building, a headquarters for your ministry, and it'll be rent-free in Orlando, Florida. He said he immediately got on the phone, said to one of his uh, 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 workers, he said, find me a realtor. We're going to go look at buildings. This is a Saturday. Said they drove around for hours and did not find a single building that was suitable. But Reinhard Bonnke did not think it was a failed day. He later said, I drove on a moment's notice knowing that I probably wouldn't find a place today but I wanted God to see that when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I obey and that I jump at his voice. God doesn't just wait for us to obey. He watches to see how quickly we obey. And I want God to know that when he speaks to me, I jump with obedience. Within a few weeks, God supernaturally provided the resources. They were able to buy a building to house their entire ministry. We need to respond in obedience. We need to respond in faith. God will 
call you. He will ask you to do things that are impossible in yourself. It's going to take a miracle. Without him, he will ask you to do things that will not work. With Listen, if all he wants you to do is things you could do without him, what do we need him for? No, he asks us to do it. Listen, Moses, you and your brother, no problem. Whole nation, you'll win. <laughs> that takes faith to give what God says. Some of you, it's like, get behind me, Satan. That's clearly from hell. <laughs> Whatever God tells you, God's voice is progressive. Jesus said it works like this. First the blade, then the ear, then the corn in the ear. It's progress. God will only tell you as much as you will obey. Abraham was told, get out of where you live and go to a land that I will show you. Tell me where we're going and then I'll... No, you just go. That's your job. He's only going to tell you as much as you obey. In the early days when I first was seeking God for miracle healing, praying for the sick. I, I wanted God to give greater miracles. I, in a service, had a man come down. He came limping very badly. That day at work, he had dropped a huge lump of metal on his foot. He's in pain. I said, okay, he told me the problem. I could see how much pain he was in. I was about to pray for him, and the Holy Spirit said to me, step on his foot. I'm thinking, I don't think he's going to be as excited. <laughs> but I'm asking God, I want miracles. And that's what God told me. I didn't tell him what I was going to do. And I said, okay, let's pray. And while I was praying, I just kind of put my foot on top and pushed. <laughs> and he wins for a second. And all of a sudden, he said, it's gone. He testified Pastor Greg stepped on my foot. I was not very happy, but he said, but the pain left. Thank God. Listen, that was great because it worked. You know, God has told me to do other things that have not worked. But the point was not, does it work or not? The point was, that's what he told me to do. And I want him to tell me more so my job is to progressively obey. You know what? Encountering the fire and responding in obedience triggers a supernatural dimension of God. Here's Moses. When he comes to the fire, then it is that God gives him the staff that will miraculously turn into a snake. His hand, when he puts it in his coat, turn leprous and, and then it gets healed. God did 10 supernatural miracles and plagues that overcame resistance. This is God at work. Moses obeyed God after he encountered the fire. God went to work and took the field on their behalf. I want you to understand this. There is nothing that we can ever face that the fire of God cannot supernaturally help and supernaturally change. I have been so stirred. I've been telling people everywhere you must read the autobiography of Reinhard Bonnke, Living a Life of Fire. It, it is incredibly inspiring. He just passed away in December. They said, 79 million people were saved in his ministry. But he tells the stories, and it is full. I just want to tell you one. He said the first time he preached a revival meeting, he was asked to preach in Kimberley, South Africa. He said the first night when he preached, there was not one young person. Every person in the building was old. After the service, he asked the pastor, he said, where are all the young people? And he said, you want to know? I'll take you. The pastor drove him 
is in the 70s, in the days of disco, and drove him to a building. It was a disco. He could hear the music throbbing. He said, that's where all the young people are. They're not coming to church. They're in the disco. The pastor asked him, he said, you want to go in and see? And, and Ryan said, absolutely not. But he said he felt the Holy Spirit tell him to go into the disco. And he goes in, I don't know, a lot of details, but he winds up, said, take me to the owner. He went to the owner and he said, would you let me speak to these people for five minutes? The man said, absolutely not. <laughs> Are you a preacher? He's dressed in a suit. Absolutely. Spoke to him, long story. The man gave him permission. He said on a Saturday night, tomorrow night at midnight, you have five minutes only. Came back at midnight. They shut off the music, said everybody sit down, and he began to preach. He had five minutes. Listen to his words. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit was there. The wind of God blew into that disco. Suddenly, I heard sobbing. I saw young people getting out their handkerchiefs and wiping their eyes. They were crying everywhere. He pulled an altar call and everybody in the disco got saved. One year later, listen to this, one year later he went back to preach for the same pastor. The pastor said, I have a surprise for you. He drove to the building that was a disco a year ago, and instead of neon signs, he saw a cross. He said so many of them were saved. They planted a church. The disco is now a church. Thank you, Jesus. You know why that was? Reinhard Bonnke, as a young boy, encountered the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he obeyed, and he could hear and see what God saw. And when we have the fire and hearts of obedience, God is able to do what we cannot do. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place.